Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. We're really glad you made it out on the final day, the final talk slot. We're really happy you're here. Um, before we get started, we just wanted to give you a sense of some of the things we're going to be talking about um, this evening, just so you know whether or not you want to stick around. And if you need to run and go have a beer or go up in Space Needle, we won't be offended. And uh, hi, everyone. My name is Neha. I'm going to introduce myself really quickly and kind of give you a little bit of my background. Um, and so I have the Audrey Hepburn Mona here, the OctaCat, because this was actually when I was teaching myself how to code. This was the first uh, OctaCat sticker that I ever chose for my laptop. Uh, and so this is actually a hard one to come by, but it uh, it represents a lot of really fond memories for me. So I am a self-taught coder. Uh, when I went into college, I actually wanted to be in biological engineering. We won't talk about how long ago that was, but let's just pretend it was really recently. And um, my first introduction to open source was actually through the science community. And so what happened was in that science community, there was a professor who was taking the concepts of open source programming and applying it to science because many people in labs are iterating on different uh, scientific lab methods, right? Like the, the, the blots and like the, um, the different like DNA synthesis. And they were figuring out what works best for their lab, but they weren't sharing it with each other. And so the first time I learned about open source was actually in an effort to be able to get people to share the different ways that they've iterated on lab methods. Uh, I eventually switched over to a few careers in a few different stages, and I eventually landed in programming. As a self-taught coder, I was also told about the open source world. I was incredibly terrified about it, but somehow through many different um, very kind people who are very intentional about opening the world to more people. I was one of the people who got swept up in that stream, and now I work at GitHub. And in GitHub, I work on the GitHub desktop product. I'm an engineering manager there, so if you go to the repo, you'll occasionally see my name, but you won't see too many fingerprints because um, my job is to help people to work together to kind of help define the processes that work for our team so that they can be at their best and they can create a thriving open source community, um, which GitHub Desktop is. So GitHub Desktop is an open source project. What it is, is it is basically kind of, at least in the old sense, it is a Git GUI. The whole goal is that if you don't want to work in the terminal, you can have GitHub Desktop as a tool that you can use to be able to commit your work and um, to kind of overlay over those different concepts. And what we aim to do is we aim to solve problems, not necessarily replicate um, buttons one for one. On top of that, we have a few things that are coming down the pipeline in the next year, and you'll see that we transition not only to being a Git GUI, but also a GitHub interface, so that when you're working locally, you'll have the information that you need when you're work like on your local machine that is pertained to like GitHub. So you're, we don't, we're not necessarily trying to replicate everything that you're doing on github.com, but we are trying to give you the information that you need from .com in your local machine at the time that you need it. One quick thing about desktop, I just wanted to say that it's uh, definitely a, a welcoming tool, more welcoming than the command line. But if you are a command line wizard, it doesn't mean that uh, GitHub desktop doesn't have anything to offer you. It actually has a pretty uh, nice set of tools for doing the normal GitHub workflow. And in some cases, it's actually preferable to the terminal. So if you've, if you've written it off as something that's only for newcomers to Git, it's actually quite powerful. So I'm Zeke. I'm also a GitHubber. Um, I am an engineer on the uh, product documentation team, working mostly on uh, internationalization. Um, when I started at GitHub three years ago, I joined the Electron team. And for those of you who don't know what Electron is, it's in a nutshell, it is the Chromium browser and the Node.js runtime um, kind of smushed together in this magical way that allows you to create desktop applications uh, using open source um, web technologies like HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. So if you've ever used any of these apps, you're running Electron apps on your machine. Um, desktop is a, kind of the quintessential desktop app, GitHub Desktop I'm referring to there, um, runs on Windows, runs on Mac. Um, and a lot of the, the companies that you see displayed on this screen here are actually active contributors to the um, Electron open source project. 
So I started um, just before Electron's 1.0 release and helped get the first major release out the door. Um, Electron has come a long way since and is now at version five. Um, and so I just met with some other Electron folks here at the, the MS Build conference this week and found out that they've actually caught up with um, Chromium. So for the entire time that I was on the Electron project, uh, the biggest challenge for the team was keeping up with Chromium, which is a very fast-moving, gigantic open source project. Um, and as of just a few weeks ago, they've actually managed to uh, keep up with Chromium. So I just want to give a shout out to the Electron team, if any of you are watching. Um, kudos to you for, for that huge milestone. Um, so after a little while on the Electron team, I kind of wanted to do something different at GitHub and just uh, change it up a little bit. Um, but it was important to me to do that in a way that didn't negatively impact my team or the Electron community as a whole. So um, I recently read this book, Broadband, about the, um, the women who, who made the internet. And one of the women featured in this book is Radia Perlman, who invented this um, tree-spanning algorithm for improving the ethernet uh, protocol. And um, what she said about her work was that it might be invisible to the everyday user, but it's invisible in the way that the laws are invisible or the rules of a traffic in, bus in a busy city are invisible. And if she does her job right, you never see it. And this is largely what engineering is about, um, doing work that you know, maybe is underappreciated, but in an ideal sense, if you're doing your work well, people don't notice it. Um, and someone else who was featured in this book is Jake Feinler. She was um, one of the uh, original sort of inventors of the ARPANET and the network, um, the network, uh, the NIC. Sorry, I forgot what it, it stands for, but um, basically the, the people who knew all of the names of all of the servers on the, the predecessor to the internet. And initially this uh, was actually called the white pages and the yellow pages, and it was a paper document that was uh, maintained by these folks at Stanford in the 70s. And if people wanted to have access to a certain machine that was somewhere on the network, they'd actually have to make a phone call or have a copy of the white pages mailed to them by the people at the NIC. Um, so what Jake did was she created this program called Whois, and they, stand, they stood up a new server and created this application for looking up uh, people by their name and uh, looking up organizations by their name and finding out more information. And now, of course, who is is this sort of fundamental Unix tool that many of us know about and is still alive on the internet today. But what Jake did is she replaced herself with a machine. So she recognized that, you know, as a single human, she was sort of a bottleneck to people finding the information that they needed. And she realized that um, you know, writing a computer pro program could, could solve that. So this really speaks to me, and this is really uh, what my work has been about in open source recently. And um, what brought us together was kind of through a series of conversations where we were both sharing some of the lessons that we learned. Um, we're both in different stages in our open source journey within our projects. And so GitHub Desktop is kind of like in the new stage, right? It's their first between first and second year, and um, like Electron has had a lot more experience in that open source project. Um, through our different lenses, we are able to kind of compile a list of tools that have been particularly effective for us, and also if you are potentially someone who's either like brand new to open source, we have some beginning tools, and if you're very experienced, we can kind of show you some of the new stuff. So if you're helping someone else, or if you're looking for a new project, these are some of the, the tools that have come up in the last year, or the last month even, that you can kind of use. We talked a lot about ourselves. We kind of gave you the in introductions of who we are and also what inspires us. And so now I kind of want you to go through this activity where I want you to close your eyes. This is just going to be 60 seconds, right? I'm only going to make you do work twice, and it's 60 seconds each time. So it's not too bad, right? Like, we're at the end of the day. Like, you came here. So I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes really quickly. And I can see you, so I will know if you are closing your eyes. I'm doing it, too. Nice job. OK, so you're closing your eyes. And what I want you to do is I want you to think about your where you are in your open source journey right now. Are you at the beginning? Do 
you have a project that you're working on, are you a maintainer? And I want you to picture where you want to be. What, it, what are you interested in? Is there an iceberg in your way? Is there something that you feel is preventing you from getting you to where you want to go? And as part of that, what questions do you have in your mind? So I'm gonna stay silent for about 15 seconds so you can think. Okay, open your eyes. Thank you for doing that homework for me so that we can also deli deliver value to you. My goal behind this is that you understand where you are in your project so that when we pr introduce these tools to you, you can also internalize how to use them with where you are right now and where you want to go. So we have, um, there's many different ways to break down the open source journey. What we've decided to do is we've decided to break it down into three sections. There's the open stage, the grow stage, and the automate stage. So the open stage is about the basics, kind of understanding the fundamentals, especially as you're bringing people on and kind of putting yourself in the shoes of a brand new user or a brand new contributor. Um, and the grow stage is about the point where you're ready to kind of scale where you are and how to build that in an inclusive way and how to skip, maximize that potential so that you can um, bring as many people as you need as, and to address all of the different areas. The automate stage is the last stage and that's about maybe you have more uh, demand than supply or maybe you are at the point where you kind of want to uh, move on to something else and you want to make it so that the same amount of work that you do scales for a lot longer. And so those are the three stages we're gonna do. We're kind of bring that, break that down into two sections per stage. And so you'll kind of hear us talk about different aspects of each stage. So let's talk about the open stage. So the GitHub flow is a process by which people use GitHub to do their work. So if you're familiar with a pull request, um, you kind of already know about the GitHub flow. Essentially, it begins with a branch. And in many cases, that actually begins with a conversation. Sometimes there's a, an issue that's opened on GitHub, and maybe that's a, a feature request or a bug report. But after that comes a branch, and that's the beginning of the work process of actually writing code. You make commits, you create a pull request, and then you push up your pull request and have a discussion with your team or the community about what this change means and whether it works and whether it's the right solution to the problem. And then you deploy in the sense that you, you test your build, you push it to staging, you make sure that everything works, and you merge with your pull request. And this is this continuous cycle. And in, in an ideal uh, sort of development environment, um, everything happens as a natural consequence of this flow. So. Um, if you want your team to be able to use GitHub without also having to know all of the intricate details about how the continuous integration system works or how the build works, or um, in many cases, your contributors may not even have the application or the library running on their local machine. So um, the GitHub flow is really where everything happens on GitHub in the pull request. So what we're talking about today is a language agnostic thing. So um, the GitHub flow applies to all languages, communities, and all programming languages. So we're not, I mean, I'm biased, but um, this is kind of a universal for how this workflow works. And so now if you are at a point where you want to start like your open source journey or you might be midway through, what we're gonna talk about is addressing the fundamentals, the basics, building that foundation. And um, so of course, if we're gonna want to do, do this, um, we should start with the problem. So um, there was a survey in 2017, it's the open source survey, and one of the questions that people, that was asked was what people observed as the biggest problems in open source. And so the top one was incomplete or confusing documentation. So that rated around 93% of people who observed this problem. I would call this a demand problem. So 93% of people observe incomplete or outdated documentation, and uh, 
uh, the supply, which this is a trick, I'm just trying to see if you're paying attention, the supply is actually 40%. So 60% of people say they rarely or never contribute to documentation, so we have a demand of 93% and a supply of 40%. The fact that there is documentation missing means that when someone is coming onto a project, they don't have the information that they need to use that, that they need in order to do what they want to do. And it may not necessarily be what this project is about. Oftentimes people genuinely want to do good things and all they need is a simple track in, in order to make sure that they're doing things within the values of the project and they're doing things in the way that the team expects. There's a lot of anxiety around that. So I'm gonna talk about some of the tools that you can do to reduce that anxiety. And you don't have to memorize this because actually if you have an open source project, aka one that is not private on GitHub, you can go onto the insights tab in your project and then go into community and you'll see this checklist. This is what it looks like when you're done. Um, so this is a checklist of all, the, all of the different things that you can do on your project in order to complete um, most of that documentation. And I'm gonna go through some brief examples of each one to give you ideas of if you already have this, what you could be doing, and if this is your first time, what is a simpler version of that? So let's start with the README. And um, if this is your first time writing a README or your first time looking at con contribution doc or you just kinda wanna re-examine what are the fundamental basics that you want to cover, I highly recommend this open source guide. And so it's a, there's many different sections. This is actually only one of them. So this one's about building welcoming communities. They actually goes through the README, the contribution doc, and tells you what the questions people are looking, the answers that people are looking for when they look at your README. And I actually like copied a bunch of this because I use it myself when it comes to making sure their documentation is right. So we're talking about the README, and I'm gonna use if me as a project example. And I love using if me as an example for a README because it is short, it's concise, and it answers all the questions. Of course, every README needs to start with the what. What is this project about? It also talks about the why, what is the purpose behind this, how to get started, and how to get more help. Right? And it doesn't have to be an entire section or entire page, right? It could be simple, as simple as a paragraph or a line. And there's some other hidden things here that I also wanted to highlight that are a little bit more advanced. So if you look here at the top, the top rectangle is about different badges, right? So it tells you about tests, it tells you about documentation, and it gives you some easy metrics, right? It helps you see that this is an active project, and it gives you a snapshot as to what this project is about. And so I, I always look for the badges, they're colorful, they're, they have high contrast, right? The eyes are always drawn towards it. Right underneath it is a readme that's in Spanish. So if people are coming onto your project, right, open source isn't just for English speakers, this is for people around the entire world. If me is a project that is localized, and now they're working on localizing their readmes. So you can see that right away you can get your, your readme in Spanish, and I'm sure that m more will come forward, and that's also another way to contribute to open source. If you speak another language, you can just translate their readme, and then they can proudly show it on their first page. The last thing that I wanna talk about is the bottom here is the contributor blurb. So you can see here that instead of having the power within the project, right, the, the, the core contributing team giving you the credit, you can actually take that credit into your own hands. And so IFME has enabled you to do this by encouraging you to add yourself to the documentation page. So this is kind of like something cool that I saw that I really wanted to highlight. The next section um, in your checklist, if you were following along, is a code of conduct. And I have really good news for you. If you look at the IFME project, their code of conduct is summarized in one line. They say, we use the wonderful contributor covenant. And that is a page that has different versions and different options for your, co your code of conduct. And you can basically co-opt that, and you don't have to recreate the wheel, right? So this is something that many projects are using, and um, they, you could either directly link it or you could take it and you could adapt it to the needs of your project because ultimately it's about your users and it's about your open source community. So this is kind of what it looks like. This is the landing page. Um, you can kind of get a basic overview and you can like see different adopters, different versions. Th these are Rails, this is Rust, this is Kubernetes. This is, I think it's like, I don't know, I don't want to get the number wrong, but I know that there's like 400K projects that are using it. It's not like a, a simple thing, it's like a very popular thing to do. And it's completely okay, you don't have to recreate the wheel. So we talked about code of conduct. 
Um, let's talk about the next step, the contributing document. The contributing document is about contributors who are coming to you and they're trying to figure out what to do. They either, they might have an idea, they might have a bug, they might wanna just like contribute to your project and they want to know what's next. And so this is like a, a catch-all for all of those things, but you basically wanna get someone to the answers that they have in a way that they feel welcome. And so I wanna show you a really simple contributing document that I feel like does that effectively. So this is uh, the Callisto project, and the Callisto project shows you what to do, directs you to the next pages for contrib contributing, submitting, reporting, and highlights the code of conduct again. Um, and that's really all it takes is kind of these simple pieces. I'm also gonna show you an advanced one. So this is a project called Tink, um, and this is kind of like a project about the, the next generation of pro uh, pro pro uh, package management. And what I really love about this is that you can see here that there's a bunch of different ways to contribute and it doesn't necessarily have to be coder centric, right? So you say, hey, I have all these abilities, I want to do something, and you're directed to the right place in order to do something different that's not necessarily coding. And another part that I love, which I don't think is included on here in the screenshot, but it's, if you scroll down, a lot of these instructions on how to contribute better are just open source contributed. So someone basically created their role or created a pathway and then kind of created a, a path back on how to do it. They taught, they're showing anyone else who wants to do it how to do that. And so you can encourage your open source contributors to also create that documentation. It doesn't have to come from the team. Um, the last part is the license. Uh, when it comes to choosing a license, there's actually a really clear pathway from uh, github.com to be able to choose your license. You don't have to do all of that research on your own. So this is what a project looks like. This is one of my projects. Uh, this is what a project looks like when you don't have all of the check marks. And you can see here for license, there's an add button. So when you click on that add button, Basically what it does is it takes you to this page of all of these different licenses. You can click on them, you can kind of see what they do and what they don't do, and you can read through the entire thing. If you choose one, so I chose the MIT license here, all you have to do is review and submit. What happens at that point is it goes to a commit, you can click create commit, goes to a PR, and then you can open the PR for that project. It takes about 60 seconds. I spent so many times uh, creating this GIF that I can guarantee it takes 60 seconds. <laughs> Um, uh, the last two things that I wanted to talk about are issue templates and PR templates. So an issue template uh, is like something relatively, uh, well, there's some added functionality for issue templates that are, that's re relatively recent. You can see in the back screenshot that that is what it looks like to specify what an issue template is. An issue template basically says, hey, I know you're interested in opening an issue. Maybe you want to open a bug report. Maybe you want to open a feature request. Here's some of the information that we might need or some of the questions that we might ask you. Um, as a open source contributor, I might be really nervous and I wanna make sure that I've shown that I'm making an effort and that I'm answering all the right questions. This is your opportunity to let them know up front some of the questions that, the answers that you might be looking for. And this is what the user sees on the front. So they open an issue and um, there's now an ability to be able to specify what an issue template is for a bug report versus an, a, a feature request. And so they will see kind of like a list of like an intro, a thank you, and then like some checklists. You can specify what you want. The other thing, this is kind of highlighting two features actually. So in the background, just like an issue template, you can specify a pull request template. I think this is particularly helpful because um, as Zeke said earlier, some like usually you want the, the contributions that you get from your community to start with a conversation. You can actually specify in your pull request what issue is this pull request addressing, right? And so you can kind of show people what kind of information you're looking for and even guide people towards that process. It's very, it's not fair to make people memorize the contributor flow, but you can reinforce that with these really helpful instructions. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to highlight in this front in the circle is um, a new feature that was released last month. So it's creating a draft pull request. And so what, in the past, you basically, as an open source contributor, you would open a PR and then you would tell people when you're done. So either in your title it would say WIP, work in progress, or you would have some sort of like known process in your contributing doc to say like, hey, when you're done, comment with an emoji or tell someone that you're done. Now you can open by creating a draft pull request and you can tell people this is a work in progress until you flip the switch and make it an actual pull request. So I think that's like really cool because you're giving the power back to your users and you're kind of letting them 
guide the process without being dependent on you, especially if you're in different time zones or anything like that. Uh, the last point that I wanted to say is uh, be nice and be human. So you get to create the culture that you want, which is as simple as saying thank you, I understand this is frustrating and it's taking so long, but I appreciate your patience, or introducing some silliness, right? Whether it's responding with GIFs or emojis, or emoji reacting, we actually doubled the amount of emo emojis that you can use to react to a project, and kind of giving them that sense of encouragement. So the first half is be nice, and the second half is be human. So often, sometimes people will open issues on your project, and they're a little frustrated, right? And it might, it will seem, it is, it is toxic in nature. Um, these people are coming from a perspective that they are confused, they might feel stupid, and they don't have a way to express that to you, right? They probably went through this so many times that by the time they're commenting, they're really frustrated and they want you to know. And ultimately in there, there's potentially a nugget of help. And so my, re my recommendation is not only to be nice to them, but it's okay to be human. Sometimes those words hurt and sometimes it doesn't feel great. It's okay to kind of show that there's a human behind that. Sometimes I've said, ouch, that hurts, right? It's very simple and it's okay to remind people that you're human. So we just talked about the open stage, right? These are the fundamentals, the basics, and some ideas that you can incorporate if you do have the fundamentals down. And this is kind of what we went over in this section. And so now we're gonna move on to the growth stage. Coding is a team sport. It's, it's more fun to, to do these kinds of projects when you actually have other people to do them with you because uh, people find your mistakes and they also inspire you and they teach you new things. Um, this is a, uh, an array of some of the organizations that I belong to on GitHub. And it kind of means a lot to me because it's reflective of um, where I spend my time and my energy and the things that are important to me on GitHub. And it's kind of like a social profile. Um, one of the easiest things that you can do to take your GitHub project and expand it to other people is to move it from your personal profile into an organization. And <clears throat> that has a few benefits. One is that um, for newcomers to your project who want to become maintainers, they can now uh, make their maintainership or their membership in the organization public on their GitHub profile so that others can see that they're involved in that project. The other thing is um, a lot of times people burn out and so maybe the original author of a project might not want to work on the project anymore but new people come along and they want to take it over and an organization is the perfect structure to allow those kinds of transitions to happen where um, the author can quietly step away and others can, can follow along and keep the project alive. So on the Electron project, we decided early on to um, be pretty generous with the permissions that we give people in our maintainers group. So when someone is making meaning, meaningful contributions to the project, we reach out to them and say, hey, we're really appreciative of the work that you're doing would you like to join our maintainers group? Which means they have access to a private repository, they're added to a special team with, with elevated permissions, and they have access to a private Slack where we can have discussions in a safe place. Um, and so being generous with permissions, what do I mean by that? I mean, um, everyone who's a maintainer has right access to the entire organization. And at first blush, that might seem a little dangerous or over generous or you know, could lead to all kinds of problems. But in practice, it's actually um, really beneficial because um, it gives every maintainer more autonomy to do work that they wanna do. They can create branches on repos without having to fork the repos. They can create new repositories in the organization without having to ask for um, anyone's blessing first. Um, and so you're kind of assuming good intent by inviting people into your organization. And there are ways to protect your organizations and your repositories too. So be generous, but um, also put checks in place to make sure that people can't accidentally 
um, do something harmful and release something into production that they shouldn't have. So this is a screenshot of branch protection on GitHub. It's actually been um, extended to have even more features since the screenshot was taken, but um, it gives you a sense of all of the things you can do to protect a branch to make sure that all of the people, the right people see it and verify it and approve it before it's actually shipped. Um, GitHub also has a feature called code owners where you can create a, a text file called code owners in your GitHub directory in your repository. Um, and what this does is it specifies which teams or individuals own which files inside the repository. And um, in conjunction with um, protected branches, you can actually specify when someone opens a pull request that modifies a JavaScript file, then someone on the JavaScript team has to approve that pull request. So that's, those are the two main things that we keep in place on the Electron project to um, ensure that the generous permissions that we've given to our maintainers um, don't get, get us into any trouble. So here's just an example screenshot of um, the code owners in action on a PR. So all contributors is this really cool um, open source project um, that makes it easy to um, recognize the contributors to your project um, and not just the code contributors. So they actually have this uh, GitHub app that you can install through the marketplace um, that gives you some capabilities to actually just write comments in pull requests to um, acknowledge contributors. And so the act of writing this comment here um, actually updates the readme of this project to say that this person did some design work on the project. And there are lots of different ways for people to contribute to open source projects. A lot of times people just think that writing code is the only thing that matters, but as Neha pointed out earlier, it's often usually about documentation and like the most meaningful contribution you can make is often just an improvement to the readme. But as you can see, there are lots of ways to help. And the All Contributors Project um, sort of codifies this and makes it easy to acknowledge people for their work. So I want to briefly talk about diversity and open source because if you're at the growth stage, you're basically at this point where as you continue to grow, the, um, the representation that you have will start to solidify and it will um, in, encourage people who look like them or work like them or think like them to kind of join that group. And so I wanted to talk about um, just a, a few different areas where you might want to take an assessment as to how diverse your team is. And so it's not just about like your open source contributors or about your team, it's a, also about like your users, right? If you're talking to different people and trying to understand the problems that your project has or that people are running into, you also want to make sure that you're polling a diverse set of people with respect to that. And it's not just about gender and race, it's also about cultural upbringing, it's about language, it's about ability and disability, it's about skill set, right? There's a whole plethora of different ways that you can kind of try to increase the diversity on your project. But I will say that if you have a leaky pipeline and you try to introduce diversity into a leaky pipeline, you're still going to get the same thing on the way out. And so I wanted to just uh, talk about five really tiny tricks that, not tricks really, these are like fundamental changes that you need to make on your project um, to be able to make your project a little bit more inclusive and kind of make it so that if you are going to introduce diversity or di diversify your project in different aspects, that it'll actually stick. Um, and th there's no guarantee here, but these are things that I, I strongly encourage you to try. So um, the first thing that I wanna talk about is enforcing the code of conduct. And so when people come onto the project, if they're newcomers, they're going to look at how um, other people are treated on your project. Seeing that you're consistently uh, enforcing the code of conduct will show them that when they introduce a new bug, ask a new question, or try to get some help, that they're going to be treated in the same way. I also wanna talk really briefly as a woman of color that like, at, when I am enforcing rules, I also get a lot more pushback than some of my coworkers. 
So when it comes to enforcing the code of conduct, I would also encourage you to, diverse, uh, to distribute some of that labor. So I do have people who aren't questioned as much, who I can call on if I don't have the spoons or the, the energy to be able to counteract and to have that productive conversation, and they can kind of make it so that I have a safer place on the project. And there's different ways that I, it's, it's up to me and it's up to my team to be able to figure out how that balance works. And so they all constantly ask me if this is what I want, and I'm able to kind of answer that question. But oftentimes, before I even get the chance to say, hey, can someone step in and kind of take care of this, they're right there with me and asking me if this is an effective way to address that problem. And so I think enforcing the code of conduct is not just about um, being consistent, it's also about finding the right distribution of labor when it comes to enforcing it. The second thing I want to talk about is a personal touch. So um, if you are on a uh, project, some, one of the new features that has been released relatively recently is that you can see if someone is a first-time contributor. And so there's a badge that shows up next to their name. And what that means is you have this opportunity to make sure that they have a really good experience and to give it a personal touch, whether it's saying thank you, whether it's kind of helping them understand that sometimes when they open a PR, it is a fantastic piece of code, but it doesn't necessarily align with the roadmap that you're going forward with. And trying to help them find another thing that they can work on if they're still interested. Or jumping offline and trying to find a way to pair together and kind of get that PR to the point that it's production ready. Um, so I wanted to talk about that, and really briefly, um, there is a study that's shown that if you respond to someone in their first 24 hours, that they're more likely, likely to contribute in the future. So having that personal touch and having someone who's around to be able to do that um, can make your project go a long way, especially making people feel included. The other thing that I wanted to talk about kind of along this sense is offering mentorship. And mentorship can happen in many different ways, right? There could be someone who's new on your project and you can offer to pair with them. You can also offer ambassadorships, right? Like we're basically taking someone who's interested in developing with us and we're, we're, we can meet with you on a week by week basis. This can be when it comes to talks or conferences. Hey, if you're a GitHub contributor or a GitHub desktop contributor, um, I'm going to this conference. If you're going to, let's meet up, let's have a conversation, let's learn a little bit more about you, right? It's about having those human interactions. And so there's a lot of different ways to offer that mentorship or offer that. You might be the one who's being mentored, right? There are also people who have different aspects, whether, especially when it comes to accessibility, right? I don't know anything about that. And so I found someone in the world who wanted to work a little bit on coding and I wanted to learn more about accessibility. We have this opportunity to have this symbiotic relationship. I'd also talk about rewarding. And so pay is really great. I think that like if you have a project that has um, the ability to collect some money through some open, open source collective or a foundation, um, to redistribute that amongst people who are contributing, especially those who are potentially marginalized. And uh, it's up to you and your team to figure out how you want to distribute that. It doesn't always have to be pay. Um, ideally, there's no, no replacement for money, right? Money is money. But um, there's other ways to reward them as well, especially with, when it comes to recognition. So um, we've had, when we had our first two people who contributed to GitHub Desktop and actually worked on a feature that ended up getting in our ne next release, we reached out to them and asked them if it was okay to highlight them in our blog. And so they were on a github.com blog, um, kind of getting highlighted as people who are instrumental to the next features that we worked on. We also have people who are recognized on our website. You can ha include headshots. Um, and you can have a lot of different ways to recognize contribution without making it a competition, making people side by side without any sort of ranking. The last thing that I want to talk about is getting feedback. So it, all of these different tools and tricks are dependent on where you are right now. And so as, contributor, as core contributors, we have the idea of what we need to do, but that is no replacement for just going out and asking, hey, what's your hesitation to open a bug? Hey, what are you looking for in your first experience? How was your first experience, and how can we make that better? It's, there's no replacement for getting feedback and talking to your users directly. They're the ones whose problems you're trying to solve, right? So those are the five tips that I wanted to talk about. So that was what we introduced in our grow stage. And so this is kind of a summary of some of the tools that we had just talked about. And so now we're going to talk about the automate stage. And I'm going to talk about that. So um, I'm going to introduce you to the GitHub Marketplace. Has anyone used the GitHub Marketplace before in the audience? 
Raise your hand if you have, I can't see you nodding. Okay, no one, great. This is awesome because I can introduce you to a new tool. So the GitHub Marketplace is a central location where you can connect third-party applications to basically uh, integrate into your GitHub workflow, make you do less work. Actually, I don't need to say it, so Corey Hobbs does a really great way. He says, he's a product manager on GitHub Marketplace. Write less code, click fewer buttons. This is the goal of the GitHub Marketplace, and I'm gonna introduce you some of the, the applications on the GitHub Marketplace that you can choose to integrate into your project. The first one is continuous integration. Um, there's really no replacement for being able to have, put the power back into your contributors so that they can see their code compile, they can get uh, feedback on whether their tests are complying, whether um, things are passing list, lint tests, and um, knowing in the end whether someone else can start testing this or not. If you have that feedback, then um, you don't have to be the one who's testing it and telling them whether it's compiling or not. Continuous integration kind of feeds that into the, the PR workflow and so they can see that information right away. So <laughs> review apps are more applicable to web applications. Um, and if you're using something like uh, Heroku or Zeit Now or Netlify or um, Azure Pipelines, they all have this kind of feature. Uh, sometimes it has different names, but they're typically called review apps. And the gist is that it's Every time a pull request is opened, the contents of that pull request's code are automatically deployed to a short-lived instance of your application online. So when people want to review your PR, they don't have to pull down the code locally and compile it and run it. They can actually just go to the website and do QA on a live running version of the site. And this is especially helpful for uh, projects where, again, a lot of the contributors may not actually have the code running on their own machine. So actually on the product documentation team, several of the technical writers just write code in their editor on, um, on, their, on their desktop, but they don't actually run the code locally at all. They just push it up into a pull request and um, the entire flow happens automatically, so they don't actually need a development development environment locally. So these two slides were from this morning. These were two people on the team, on the docs team, who switched from our old system to our new staging setup where um, we get a, a free staging application for every single pull request that's open without any manual operations. So it's, it's happy to see that our users are actually appreciating this new workflow. Um, another one I want to talk about is the welcome bot, and um, there is like definitely a spectrum between automated responses and having a personal touch, but I strongly encourage you to explore the welcome bot and kind of see where you want to go along that. And so you can have the welcome bot uh, automatically respond to issues and PRs with a friendly message. And so here's an example of one for an issue. So you have a new issue from a new user and the welcome bot can say, hey, like, welcome, so glad you're here for this project and here's like some information that you might need to know and like, we're going to get back to you soon, right? Um, this is helpful because it, People in the open source community will notice if everyone is using canned replies. Um, canned replies are great, but if they're going to be the exact same one every single time and they're not custom tailored, you might as well have a bot do it. And that way you can get someone who responds to you immediately and gives you the next step. Um, and after that, you can kind of follow in with a personal touch and comment about something specific in that issue um, or in the PR um, that like is specific positive feedback or constructive feedback. So this is um, also an example of the welcome by uh, responding to a brand new PR. And you can also have it to do it on a first PR merge. And so you can even use it as a way to introduce some silliness and some friendliness to the team, right? Um, your welcome bot can be silly too. Another one I wanted to talk to you about is called Access Lint. And so um, accessibility is often an afterthought when it comes to building a project, and that's because a, you need someone who's like in the PR process, who's reviewing your code to know all of the rules all the time, um, which can be done either by like A, training everyone, or B, like recruiting people who already know all of that answers, all of those answers, or, um, or you can have an application do it for you. 
So here's an example here. So you can see some code with an image tag, and Access LintBot actually automatically finds the areas where alt tags are missing and can comment and say, hey, you're missing it here. Here is who it's affecting, and here is how you can find a solution for yourself, right? So it's a great tool where you're taking that, you're turning that into an automated process, and that means that you can build accessibility in from the ground up, and it doesn't have to be an audit every six months. So I have two more tools for you. One is called Twitter Together. So um, another huge part of an open source project, especially as it's thriving, is marketing and being able to showcase the work that you're doing and also to um, say thanks and like give shout outs to people who are your contributors. And of course, what ends up happening is you have a Twitter account and like either everyone knows this super easy password or the password is held by one person. Ultimately, what you want is people to have a conversation around what you want to tweet and not have to worry about the credentials whatsoever. And so that's what the Twitter Together um, application does. And so basically you have this tweets folder and you can create a very simple link where someone can create a tweet and then people can have a conversation around the content that they want to tweet out and then be able to do that um, without needing to deal with any of the logistics or doing this over Slack, right? It can be documented and it can have a conversation around it. So this is a really cool th thing. And um, the last one that I wanted to talk about is Dependabot. One of the wonderful things about open source is that you can have different packages and those are your dependencies. But keeping up with dependencies is a very manual process, especially as you are working with your team, you want to introduce uh, updates to your packages at the right time. Um, and often that means that you're codifying these certain rules within your team around which dependencies you want to upgrade and at what point. And so you might as well automate it. And so Dependabot allows you to do that. So one of the things that differentiates Dependabot from other services like it, like Greenkeeper or uh, RenovateBot is just the amount of configuration that you can do on the, um, the update process. So if you don't want every single update to every single dependency in your application, you can just get security updates. Um, the way that this is really useful for the Electron project is that we have a number of internal NPM modules that get published um, on a pretty regular cadence. So our internationalization pipeline involves um, content that lives in other repositories that's published to NPM automatically. And we want our website to be able to automatically get those updates and have them deployed to production. So Dependabot has a flow where you can whitelist a certain set of modules, and when updates come into those modules, as long as they pass all of the GitHub status checks, they'll automatically be deployed to production. So this is how we were, enable, we're able to set up a hands-free internationalization and localization process for all of Electron's documentation into 25 languages. So semantic releases is a really awesome concept. Um, if, you're, if you're managing um, libraries that have uh, versioning requirements, like if you're publishing things to NPM or Ruby Gems or something like that, and you want to be able to um, um, bump up the version, you typically use this uh, semantic versioning approach. Um, and so in the parlance of the Semver spec, these numbers are called major, minor, and patch. But in practice, they're actually a breaking change, a feature, and a fix. So as you make fixes, the version number goes up. As you make features, the version number goes up, and so on. And this is a very manual process, um, but the, the semantic release sort of concept um, enables you to automate this. So the Angular project, which you probably all heard of, created this, I don't know if they created it, but they popularized this notion of having semantic commit messages. So when you're writing a git commit, you include a prefix that indicates the nature of the change that you're making. So in this case, um, this is a new feature. Um, the important triggers for doing a semantic release are the fix, the feature, and the breaking change. So with this semantic information included in a commit message, um, you can actually automatically determine what the next version of your software, the version number should be. So here's an example where a fix becomes a patch release, a feature becomes a feature release. 
and a breaking change within the commit message indicates that we should do a major version bump. So the Electron project uses a, a GitHub app called Semantic Pull Requests that kind of takes the semantic commit concept and applies it not specifically to commit messages but to pull requests themselves because that's sort of the unit of work that happens on GitHub. So when a contributor makes a contribution and opens a pull request, it's up to the contributor to specify what the nature of the change is. Is it a feature or is it a fix? Um, and it is just that one action that indicates how that's going to influence the version number that's created and how the uh, software will be published. So the desktop team actually uses a custom um, changelog generator to um, uh, call out and acknowledge the contributions from the community um, in their changelog on the desktop website. So you can see here it says, um, on the second line it says, thanks, uh, jQuinny. And so we have a script that automatically pulls those names so that we can thank them in an automatic fashion and make sure that we don't forget anyone. Rolling your own. So if you wanted to see a little bit of code, um, We'll show you some now. <laughs> so GitHub has these things called webhooks, and they're basically these HTTP events that are fired when things happen on GitHub. So here's a bunch of uh, examples of them. So basically anytime anything happens on GitHub, a webhook is fired. And you can write an application that can listen to these events and respond to them. So Probot is an open source application. Um, and a framework created by GitHubers, but it's totally open source and has contributors from lots of different organizations. It's a Node.js web server um, that's powered by Express that um, can react to webhook events on GitHub and respond in interesting ways. So here's a little bit of um, example code to show how a Probot app works. So it can respond to an event like an issue being opened. And the uh, context object that is included in the, in the, uh, the handler is a pre-authenticated GitHub client that is fully, that already has a token and is already able to uh, perform actions on GitHub at, on behalf of your app. So, um, this, this is just kind of like a teaser, but like basically all of the applications that we just showed you use this concept of um, webhooks to um, tie into activity and respond to it on GitHub. So if you want to write your own, if you have some custom requirements like Electron, the Electron team has a couple of Probot apps for these types of things for change log generation. Uh, the VS Code team has um, their own custom Probot apps for doing um, sort of uh, artificially intelligent triaging of issues to determine whether things are uh, feature re requests or bug reports, or um, they also use it for um, detecting um, you know, foul language, things like that. So it's really powerful and really fun. Um, definitely want to try and find the solution to your problem in the marketplace first, because if someone's already written it, all you have to do is click that button. But in those cases where you need your own thing, Probot is a great answer. Um, GitHub Actions is similar to Probot. It is a tool um, built on GitHub that reacts to activity on GitHub. Um, it's a little different in that it is powered not by a Node.js web server, but uh, by Docker containers that you can configure with a, a, a text configuration file. So this is just a screenshot from the, um, the Actions web page. But it kind of gives you a sense of um, what happens. Uh, a push comes into your repository, and it triggers a build using a certain Docker container. And in when that Docker container is, has performed its action, it can pass on the results of that action to yet another Docker container or multiple Docker containers. Um, so this is really cool because it's kind of a language agnostic um, platform for executing code. So you could have one tool that was written in Python and another one that's written in you know, C Sharp, and the two of them could be 
uh, working in conjunction to perform some task in response to events on GitHub. So this is like the, what the workflow files look like. So um, there's a visual editor on GitHub for managing these GitHub actions, but you can also actually just um, write this configura configuration file. So this is a very basic example that uses a lightweight node container to um, install dependencies and run tests. So you can actually use this um, on your repository and as an alternative to, some, to a CI provider. So if you didn't want to use um, uh, Circle CI or Azure Pipelines or whatever, you want to just do something more basic, you can use GitHub Actions for exactly that. That's kind of the default use case. Um, so this is what it looks like in practice. You're on a pull request and you see that these actions have run and you can actually make these actions required in order for your pull requests to be merged. Um, so we saw earlier the Twitter together application and that uses GitHub Actions. Um, and part of what makes it possible is this little known new feature of GitHub that allows you to store secrets on your repository. So you can actually go into your settings on your repo. There's a new, there's a new secrets uh, menu item and you can put your Twitter auth credentials in there and your GitHub action will have access to those in its environment at runtime. So you keep your, you keep your secrets out of your code but they're still on GitHub in a central place. Lastly, GitHub Actions has a scheduling feature which is very similar to cron. So if you want to have an action that runs um, on a schedule rather than in response to a specific event on GitHub, you can do that as well. So if you wanted to have a, uh, a service that collects data from some remote endpoint at yeah, every hour or so, you can use GitHub Actions to do that. Furthermore, GitHub Actions uh, have your, the Docker container also has the contents of your repository as a Git repository in its environment. So you can actually commit to Git within your Git action. So it's, you can almost use a GitHub action as a, as a meta user of your repository to do all kinds of interesting things. So the sky's the limit with GitHub actions. We'll see what people create with them. And um, this kind of brings our talk to an end. So we just talked about the automate stage. Here are some of the tools that we introduced you to um, if you are interested in looking more, especially if this is further down the line but you just want to be reminded. But I actually have uh, everything that we talked about today. So these are all of the different tools and tricks that we introduced to you. So if you are interested in learning a little bit more, you want to go back and kind of check it out. This is, the whole point of this talk is to introduce you to a plethora of tools and you can figure out what works for you. So this is, those are the keywords that you would want to use uh, to f learn a little bit more. So I have your last 60 seconds of work. Um, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and uh, what, oh wow, you guys already did it. Most of you did. Close your eyes. And what I want you to think about is think about that initial image that you had. Where are you on your open source journey? Where do you want to be and what is holding you back? And now I'm, gonna, I'm about to be silent for about 15 seconds. I want you to think about the next thing that you want to look at or you want to try. So I'm going to be quiet now. Okay, open your eyes. So uh, I hope you have a bunch of new tools. I hope you're super excited to try something new and to do a little bit more research. Hopefully you now know what you wanna do. Feel free to write it down so you don't forget. Um, and that's our talk. My name is Neha. I'm Zeke. Thank and so thanks much. so much for spending your last hour of your day with us. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your appreciation. Yeah. So have a great end of your day and maybe see you at the party. Yeah.